If you couldn't tell from the location, I'm I'm home visiting. We have a guest <laughs> who's going to be sitting in the back room probably barking the entire time. But without further ado, hey world, it's Paige. Welcome back to my channel. And today I'm actually here to talk about books. Imagine that. What fucking hold does incest have on this woman that she just keeps including it as a plot point? That might say more about me than the internet needs to know, but I've already said it. <laughs> So originally, I was only going to do a video where I was talking about the books that I've liked recently, <laughs> but then I was struggling to find enough books that were like four stars and up that I wanted to just like round up in a video since I've only read nine books so far this year. So I just decided, you know what? I'm going to talk about every book, whatever, who cares? So in an effort to not make this video super long, let's just get into it. The first book that I picked up for the year was The Last Graduate by Nomi Novik. This is the second book in the Scholomance series that follows a young wizard and her friends as they're trying to survive their final year in a deadly magical school. The main draw for me was the himbo guy and like the very dark girl. So I came back for that, especially with the way the last book ended. It ended on a hit cliffhanger. And I was totally under the assumption that this was a duology. So as a completionist, this would have been like an easy finish for me. Only to learn when I went on Goodreads today that it's actually a trilogy. <laughs> So I have one more book apparently in the series to finish it. And that sort of like complicates the way I feel about the book because I thought the ending was very interesting. If it was a duology, I was like, that's a ballsy, bold choice. Now it's just another cliffhanger. And like to end both books on a cliffhanger that makes you want to read the next one is very impressive. I'm just curious more so less about the cliffhanger and more about what happens in the third book because the conventions that set up the premise of the first two books is now completely overturned. I'm trying not to spoil <laughs> anything about the book, but like everything has shifted fundamentally for the characters. So I'm curious to see what she even decides to do with that third book. If you enjoyed the world and the characters of A Deadly Education and the internal monologues didn't turn you off of that first book, you will not have a problem with the second one, I'm sure. The second book that I read for the year was For Work and that is The Maid by Nita Prose. This book follows a maid at a fancy hotel and what happens when she finds one of the guests dead in his room. It's gonna be adapted, Florence Pugh is attached to it. It's such a big book. <laughs> and it only just came out. Pros of this one are the cast for sure. I thought they were very warm and cute, specifically a lot of the cast that are good that work at the hotel. The hotel as a setting itself was also really interesting. It's not set in any specific city or place, so it's kind of ambiguous and it really makes it easier to escape into the story because you're not seeing anything with familiarity. The cons are that the one character of color is a straight stereotype. He was not fleshed out at all. It was one of the things that really drew me out of the story whenever he was in it because it felt like there there was no trying really to make this person to make this character feel like a person. And I wonder if part of that is because of the conventions of a whodunit. Like there are like character types, but again, a whole ethnicity is not a character type. The second con for me personally was that the protagonist is very obviously on the spectrum, but the author does not share this identity. But because it is such an integral part to the way the story is framed, that sort of, it made me hesitant as I was reading it. I was very concerned the entire time. It just highlights that we are still perpetually taking these narratives written from the perspectives of people who are inherently more privileged. I'm not gonna get into the whole pipeline of cishet white women who work in publishing, getting major book deals um, that come with adaptations and huge media pushes. That is That could be a whole video in and of itself. And this is about reviews. So we're gonna swiftly move on <laughs> to the next book, which is Dirty Rowdy Things by Christina Lauren. This was something that was recommended to me by my roommate who I was complaining about like wanting to turn off my brain and read something like see me and fine. And they recommended this one to me. I do not remember the character names for this one. All I know is it was about a girl whose parents were famous like her dad was a producer her mom was an actress and he's a fisherman like his family owns boats and shit <laughs> that was very eloquently described and so like it's all about them getting together being angsty about if they're gonna work as a couple content warning for anyone who is triggered by reading about cancer the mother of the female protagonist does get diagnosed and undergo treatment during this plot so if you are uncomfortable reading about that kind of stuff maybe avoid this one this was a very mid book for me <laughs> clearly because I do not remember character names at all. I will probably continue on in this series like I didn't hate it. It just was a very forgettable read for me and if you're not new here you know that brain off books are something that I'm constantly looking for. This isn't like the supreme of brain off books but it was a good escape 
for the time period that I was reading it. Next up was These Violent Delights. This was read for House Salt Book Club. This is our first pick of the year. I'm not gonna go super in depth into this because we had a whole live show about it, which I will link so that you can watch if you were really interested in all of our thoughts, which I think that live show was off the rails. All of our live shows so far have been off the rails. They're off to a great start this year. But this book is a Romeo and Juliet. They say retelling, I say inspired by, that is set in 1920 Shanghai. And it follows two gangs and what happens when their tenuous hold on power is put to the test because of something supernatural. Long story short, this was another mid read for me. It was mostly the writing that didn't work. It just, it felt like a debut author's novel, if that makes sense, because the high level concept was very interesting. And a lot of like the premise should have worked for me, but it didn't. I just felt myself just reading to get through the book for the book club. Honestly, if we weren't reading for book club, I probably wouldn't have continued on past the first chapter because I was kind of hesitant. It felt like we were going in circles, like every time an element of the mystery was revealed, it didn't feel like it was really a revelation. It didn't really feel like it impacted the characters or the plot in any substantial way. I am a completionist, so I will be finishing this duology at some point. It helps that it's a duology because I'm gonna finish it. I'm just not rushing to finish it. And I do think I will like some of the author's future work. I feel like, as the years go by and maybe a book that isn't a retelling I will probably like more that also was a factor in it I can't remember what I said exactly so if you want like my pure unfiltered thoughts after recently finishing the book that will be linked for you to watch and then at the beginning of February I read Chain of Iron this is the second book in the new series from Cassandra Clare I don't know what the name of this series is specifically I I was not paying attention to that, honestly. And the plot is very hard to describe because it is literally just pretty people being angsty, pining for each other. That is what this series is set in like Victorian times, maybe old England, some kind of old England where I would not be free. <laughs> it's exactly what you would expect from a Cassandra Clare novel. If you liked the Immortal Devices, is that the one with the, the other old timey one? Whichever one that was about the parents of the children in this book, if you like that series, you would obviously like this series. If you like Santa Clara, you will like this series. And like, sometimes you just need to read a book where you know what you're gonna get when you go into it. And I really liked the first book in this series because it was pretty people being angsty, pining for each other. I wanted familiarity. I wanted characters that I had already invested myself in, a story that I already somewhat knew. So I returned to this one. I did start reading it in December of 2021, but it's chunky. It's like 600 and some odd pages. I hardly read books that thick. And it was too big to pack to bring with me to Barbados. I did not have room in my carry-on for that so I left it here and started back in February when I was done reading all the other books that I had to read at the beginning of the year. I will say there is a little suggested incest toward the end-ish of the book and what fucking hold does incest have on this woman that she just keeps including it as a plot point? Like that made me cat When I read that, I was like, why are we doing this again? Why? Honestly, someone, if you have an answer for that, please tell me. The next book I read for work was Yinka, Where Is Your Husband? This was on my own personal TBR when I first read about it, so I was glad that I got to read it for work. It follows a British Nigerian woman Yinka whose family has been pressuring her to get married as the older sister of someone who is already married and <laughs> about to have a kid. She goes to her friend's engagement party and runs into an ex who has a new girlfriend slash a fiance. I'm pretty sure they're engaged. So that inspires her to take her dating back into her own hands to find someone to bring to her friend's wedding, which perfect setup. I love reading these kinds of plots. It was such a wholesome book. It was what I needed to pick up next. I kept thinking about the book and kept wanting to read it. It really was the driving factor for me finishing <laughs> any books in the month of February because I felt like a little bit of a reading slump at that point. It tackles religion in a way that I hadn't really read in a rom-com before. Identity, blackness, being part of a diaspora community. If you're a fan of rom-coms like Bridget Jones's Diary, it gave me huge vibes of that because it is a British story or also starstruck I watched recently and it kind of reminded me of that kind of vibe for when I was in a funeral you know where it's like not the romance isn't the primary point of the story it is like a part of it that spurs on the story the only thing that didn't work for me was they sometimes include like google searches like screenshots of google searches or texts that just feel like they're gonna date the book in a way that will harm it in the future. But for the moment, it was good, 10 out of 10. Highly recommend this book. I think everyone should read it. It was just so fun. The next book I'm going to say very little about because there's a whole video about it that you can watch and that is Ice Planet Barbarian. There's actually two videos because we also talked about it on the live for House of Book Club. All I've got to say about it outside of the vlog that I filmed of me reading it is it was very mid. It is the first book in a very long series of Alien Smet that took TikTok by storm. It's not as spicy as I was expecting it to be. I was truly expecting really wild sex scenes because it is alien 
related. No, no, it was very tame, very mid. <laughs> I could read it without even flinching, blushing, nothing. I don't know what that says about me. That might say more about me than the internet needs to know, but I've already said it. <laughs> and it's not sure if it wants to take the premise of girl gets kidnapped by aliens, found by another alien and falls in love seriously or not and that makes for a very confusing reading experience in my opinion but a lot of people like this series so worth a try i am out like you might end up really liking it more than i did the eighth book that i read i just finished yesterday like literally i've been hustling to finish books so i had more to talk about for this video but it's a book that i read for work and i love when i pick up a book that wouldn't necessarily be on my radar for whatever reason like for this reason it was i thought it was a little too literary for me so i was like you know what brain off energy page just saying no but since i had to read it for work i really prioritized putting time aside to read it and i'm so glad that i did because this was such a good read and it was so unexpected for me i just when I was reading it, it felt so satisfying in a way to be like, oh my god, I'm, this is art. It's so good. This is a translated novel that follows a family of refugees from Vietnam and their journey to emigrating to Canada. The narrative style is so interesting. It's a mix between prose and poetry and I was captivated by it honestly. I just thought it was so smart and the way the author is able to entirely encapsulate like an idea of being disconnected from your heritage because of your displacement due to war in throwaway lines that are so obviously very meticulously crafted. It just was genius. I <laughs> like I said, I was stunned reading this. I was obsessed with it. Even though it sounds like it's very like hoity-toity literary, it's very accessible. And <laughs> if I can read it, you can read it. Please believe me. And the final book on this list that I have finished so far is No One Asked for This by Kazi David, who I didn't realize, but was told by my roommate is Larry David's daughter, which makes sense because this was from the moment I turned the first page of this book, I had to take a photo of it for my like close friend story on Instagram because it was so relatable. The humor was very in line with my own in some parts. I laugh at least once while reading every essay. And I actually picked up this collection because I saw a mailing on somebody who I follow on Instagram. I saw a mailing up for this book, which had a bunch of stuff that just made it seem like the book's vibe was gonna be very much my style. And whoever did that mailing deserves a promotion. It was right, like that was the perfect way to capture me as an audience person, like a millennial audience member that is on Instagram. You caught the right vibe. It's hard to describe essay collections because it's literally just a bunch of stories from a specific person. It deals a lot with like mental health, with being a millennial, a lot of self-deprecation, which is my personal style of humor. I will say toward the latter half of the book with the later essays, it sort of felt like any kind of relatability that I had with it slowly started to recede because it was becoming so insulated in the sphere of being an overprivileged white woman. The one essay specifically that made me start thinking about this was Privileged Assistant, funnily enough, the title of it should have let me know, but Overall, it was like a very fun, very warm read. Had a good time with it. It was good for the first two thirds of the book. So those are the nine books that I've read so far this year. You should let me know if you have read any of them and what your thoughts are in the comments. I will see you in my next video. Hopefully I continue to read after this because I really did truly read those last two books so quickly just so I could talk about them. Let me know if there are any books you think I should pick up in the time between now and my next wrap up. I'll see you guys in my next video and until then stay safe.